We're delighted to welcome you all to this webinar um, for HCLG. Simon and I will be um, hosting the webinar today and um, we'd like to introduce you to our working group leads who are going to take us through deep dives into our specific different um, focus areas. So we've got Jim Beeston for um, mental health, George Mosey on MSDs and John Dunn supported by Denver Coulson for respiratory health. So just to recap the vision and mission that we have in HCLG, um, we really want to make sure, and we have for many years now, that we start shouting health more effectively, particularly uh, mental health. And we see it as a critical area to treat just like we have historically with safety. So we had that goal of 2025 um, and having a really strong focus on what we can do moving forward and, and keeping the energy and the awareness around occupational health um, is something the HCLG is really passionate about. Um, so, in terms of different organisations, we are delighted and privileged to have loads of different organisations supporting HCLG and part of HCLG. Um, if you do want to get more involved um, or you know other organisations that may want to support, then please do reach out via the website or um, one of the chairs or working group members. Um, in terms of kind of focus and what we've achieved to date, we have had loads of um, focus on specific things like mental health, the work that Mates in Mind have done particularly to shine a light on mental health and bring much more focus around it. I think the industry as a whole is talking about mental health in a very different way than we have done historically, which feels really exciting, even though there's a lot more work to do. Um, other areas such as creating more understanding and awareness around the role that occupational hygiene plays and how that really facilitates and supports occupational health management and also how that interplays with well-being as well um, and how they as a collective can really support um, organisations to have people that thrive um, is something else that HCLG has, has um, highlighted effectively. Case studies um, have been really critical so it's brilliant that we've had case studies being shared with us in the past so that we can highlight those and share what has worked to support other organisations in, in seeing what has worked. But again, we'd love to get more case studies. So this is a definite shout out. If there's any ideas that you have to facilitate us to collate more of those, then that would be brilliant. Um, and obviously the other areas our working group chairs will be focusing on, um, including MSD and respiratory health today. So over to you, Simon. You're on mute, Simon, just in case you hadn't realised. Thank you. Good old schoolboy error. Um, thanks, uh, Henrietta. And uh, yeah, I was just saying, uh, very pleased to be with everybody today for the first time uh, as the, uh, the the new co-chair of uh, Health in uh, Construction Leadership Group. So um, as I think most of you will be aware, we've got these three uh, focus areas uh, that we're uh, currently taking forward of respiratory disease, MSDs and mental health. And you'll be hearing more about those uh, as, as we go through this webinar today from our, our subgroup leads. Um, this, uh, we, we revised our strategy last year and uh, republished it. And uh, if you haven't already seen that or had a chance to have a look at it, please do take a look on the HCLG uh, web pages where you'll see that set out and it provides the rationale for what we're doing uh, and, uh, and where we're planning to uh, to move forward in the future. Um, if you could um, just uh, go on to the video, please. Yasmin, thank you. One construction worker dies from a construction-related fatal accident most weeks in the year. In 2021 and 2022, there were 39 deaths. But for every one of those fatal accidents, approximately 100 construction workers lose their lives due to ill health, this being predominantly from cancers caused by past exposures at work. There are roughly 8,000 cancer deaths and 12,000 lung disease deaths a year in Great Britain. Approximately 40% of these occur among construction workers, even though they only make up around 4% of the total workforce in Britain. Uh, thanks, Jasmine. If you would just like to move on to the next one, thank you. So um, we know that we've got a a big mountain to climb on this one. And whilst we've 
started to make some really good progress and we have have put mental health much more on the map. I think the the awareness of uh, ill health that can arise through uh, uh, everyday construction acti activities has improved, has got better, and there has been some good sharing of, 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 of good practice. We know that you know, the, the toll is still enormous really from um, construction related ill health. Uh, and so th these figures really provide quite a stark reminder of that, that there's still uh, quite a, a big job to do. And of course, we're not just talking about physical health, but mental Ill, Ill health as well. Um, if you could move on to the next slide, please. So really today, um, you know, it, 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 there's, a, there's an opportunity to reflect uh, on what we've achieved and how we've achieved that. So working together, coming together as a collective across the industry, sharing that good practice really does help um, those uh, across the industry to sort of embrace those things and, 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 and embrace new um, technology and innovation. Uh, but um, what we're, we're keen to do really is to really tap into everybody's uh, ideas as to you know, how we can continue to make progress and move forward. And we will be holding uh, our next steering group meeting towards the end of uh, April. Um, so Today, really, having uh, once you've you've heard what uh, each of the subgroup leads has, uh, has to say in their areas, please do um, come to us with with any suggestions or queries or requests really for further support that you may have. And uh, what we'll do is uh, make sure that we really give that a good um, discussion uh, when we get together with the steering group and we'll make sure that we're still progressing in the right direction. Uh, OK, so I think now that's um, time to hand over to uh, my colleague John Dunn, uh, who's going to speak to you about uh, the work of the respiratory subgroup. Great, thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks. Thanks, Simon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for taking the time to join the webinar today. Uh, I'm John Dunn. Uh, I'm the director of uh, Safety, Health, Environment, Quality, uh, and sustainability and anything else they can call me for these days at Waits Group. I've recently also willingly volunteered, I'd say, to chair the uh, HCLG Respiratory Working Group. So today I'd like to just very briefly explain um, what the working group wants to try and achieve in 2023 and beyond. Um, but also the session today is uh, it's going to be a bit of interactive fun, uh, hopefully. Uh, we've uh, We've got a bit of a quiz to uh, to go through. Um, there's absolutely no pressure at all for the uh, for the quiz. Uh, unfortunately, no prizes either because we ran out of the budget. We spent it all on Slido, which we're going to be using. Um, so we'll get onto that in a second. Uh, so before we start, um, I'm going to ask you all, everybody on the call, if we can do this. I'm going to ask you all in a second to take a deep breath. Um, so, so a breathing technique um, that I often use, and this helps me uh, de-stress, calm down, um, is I breathe in for three seconds. You probably all sort of, uh, or a lot of you might have come across it before. Breathe in for three seconds, hold for four seconds, and then you breathe out fully for five seconds. So I'd like us all to try that together. And I'll, I'll sort of lead us in. Okay, I'll do the counting. All you have to do is the breathing bit. OK, so we're going to start now. So I want you all to breathe in for three seconds. So that's one, two, three. OK, now I'm going to hold that for four seconds. One, two, three, four. And then all breathe out nice and slowly. Big five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. It's good job I can count, isn't it, really? We'd be in real trouble. Now, excellent. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. So for most of us, that was easy, right? Nice and easy. Uh, but for 49,000 people each year in the UK who report that they have breathing or lung problems, a simple exercise like that is very, very difficult for them to do. And people suffering from uh, respiratory conditions regularly have shortness of breath, uh, often referred to as air hunger. 
they sometimes suffer also from um, rapid breathing as well, leading to confusion and panic. It's incredibly uncomfortable for people that suffer from lung conditions. And each year, the HSE estimate 12,000 people die from lung disease alone, linked to past exposures at work. So really one aim for our uh, uh, for the HLC, C, HCLG Respiratory Working Group is we've got to reduce that number considerably by chipping away at the different types of work related exposures that can lead to lung disease. And there are many of these exposures at work, but you've got to start somewhere, right? So one of the aims this year for us as a working group is we're going to start by supporting the latest HSE campaign, which you're going to hear more from uh, Denver straight after me. So first, right, let's let's try and sort of see how much we know um, about uh, respiratory conditions. Um, let's test our knowledge. Uh, let's get into some of this stuff. I'm going to sort of share my screen now. I'm going to move into Slido. I'm going to ask you all to have your phones out. You don't normally hear that, do you? But I'd like you to get your phones out because I'm going to ask you to sort of take part in the quiz as well. So nice and simple. But we have to be quick as well because we've only got sort of uh, less than 10 minutes. So I'm going to share my screen now. You'll see, hopefully, if it all works, it could be a huge success or it could go incredibly badly and um but what let's let's take a go let's see what happens hopefully in uh, a few seconds you will see a um a barcode come up and also uh or, or there's a website there that you can use and a hashtag hclg so i'm going to sort of hope that the majority of you can see that okay and what I'll do is I'll probably look at one of my fellow presenters for the thumbs up to make sure that at least one of them can see it anyway. Brilliant. Excellent. Wow, that's very good. OK, good. So let's start it off. Let's kick it off. Now, um, if you were listening to when I started, hopefully we should get at least uh, quite a few people get this right. So let's see. The first question then, how we got how many occupational lung disease deaths each year can be linked to past exposures at work? That's not bad, is it? That's really, yeah, that's great. Absolutely. So let's have a look. Have we got that right? Yeah, right one. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's good. 79% of us got it right. OK, yeah. And in total, as again, as you if you were listening correctly, as Simon said, um, you know, there's an estimated 13,000 deaths linked to past exposures at work, primarily as well. These are chemicals and dust, with at least 12,000 of those es estimated lung diseases. So, next question. Here we go. So, the construction industry accounts for the most cases of occupational cancer amongst the industrial sector. So, all of all of these sectors. How high is that percentage? Wow. That's, uh, that's very good. Brilliant. Oh, oh, we've got a bit of a change. We're changing. We're moving. Let's. We've got to be quick. We've got to be quick. Let's see. Correct answer. And the correct answer is yeah, forty percent. Forty percent. So again, very high number. Fantastic. We've got a very, very, very smart crowd here this afternoon listening in. Yeah, construction sector, the largest burden of occupational cancers amongst all industrial sectors, 40% occupational cancer deaths are from the industry. And most cancers as well in construction were lung cancers caused by exposure to asbestos, asbestos or silica. So let's do next slide. Here we go. So again, third question, now number three, which occupational lung disease accounts for the highest estimated annual current deaths in the UK. Go give it a couple of seconds. There you go, got some different ones here and I'm going to sort of quickly jump on and show the correct answer. And the correct answer is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease COPD. Absolutely. Yeah, for those who got it right, almost again, sort of 80% there. People living with COPD struggle to keep working. It's very, very very, very, very sort of uncomfortable condition. And what makes it worse is dusty places, fumes, vehicle fumes that could be strong smelling cleaning products even can all increase the chances of COPD flaring up. So not only 
can it affect their long term harm to health, but it also can prevent them from carrying on uh, work and, 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 and act, being active during their sort of lifetime. And next question here then. So how many workers are, ex are estimated to be exposed to crystalline silica dust annually in the UK? Some big numbers here. Let's see what we've got. Good. OK, very good. Let's have a look. And there, the correct answer, there is 600,000 workers estimated to be exposed to crystalline silica dust annually in the UK. Incredible high numbers. And we all know silica is a major uh, a constituent of construction materials, you know, found in bricks, tiles, concrete, mortar, and the dust associated with cutting, grinding, or drilling any of these materials is so fine that it can't be seen in normal light. So again, this is a huge focus area and will be a focus area for us moving forward. Now, final question. I've been very impressed with everybody, how much knowledge we have out there, it's fantastic. Final question here. So link to asbestos and leads us nicely into Denver, who's going to be talking about asbestos in the HSC campaign next. Who's required to take asbestos awareness? Cat A, category A training. Give you a couple of seconds. Very, very impressive. Absolutely. Let's see. Hopefully, uh, as I'm clicking the button, hopefully you can see that you that the correct answer is coming up. I'm just trusting that you're all, you're all being able to see this. But yes, yeah, so 96 percent of people got that right. Anyone who may disturb asbestos at all in their work. Um, uh, should be at least um, uh, going through category A asbestos awareness training. Yeah, three types of asbestos training, A, B and C, and C being designed for high risk work that must be carried out by licensed and competent contractors only. So there you go, that is the end of my quiz. Uh, I'm very, very impressed with uh, with the amount of knowledge we have out there. The reason I chose those sort of questions is mainly because they're, they're some of the areas that we're going to be focusing on as a working group. And if anybody out there is interested in knowing more about the working group, please get in touch with us. Uh, any volunteers out there would like to join us and help us. But thanks very much for listening. I'm going to hand over to Denver. Thank you, John. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Denver Colson. I'm the head of campaigns for the Health and Safety Executive. And I'm just here to give you a quick overview of our latest campaign. So I'll just share my screen here, which, as you may have guessed, um, if you saw the branding above me, because I like to lift the brand, um, is Asbestos and You. So to, to give you a little bit of background, um, it will be no surprise um, when you read information on the screen, um, you know, that asbestos remains a problem. Um, you know, despite the fact it's been, you know, not been used in construction or you know refurbishment of buildings for 23 years, um, it's still there, still in a huge amount of buildings, especially in the domestic market. Um, so we were looking to um, respond to the Department of Work and Pensions Select Committee as well. So as those of you will probably know, there's um, a Select Committee report last year. It had 16 recommendations, and government has committed to 13 of those recommendations. Um, and we are delivering those as HSC, many of them. And one of those, um, just one by the way, um, is committing to in, uh, more sustained campaigning work. So the last campaign HSC did predominantly on asbestos was in 2014-2015, which was Beware Asbestos. So we're looking to um, increase our campaign works and it will be two different audiences. There's the tradespeople, people who might get exposed to it every single day through the nature of their work. And there's also a duty to manage element, so people more in commercial buildings. Um, but asbestos and you, what I'm talking about today is about targeting tradespeople. So ultimately, you know, our policy objective is to decrease people becoming afflicted and ultimately potentially dying from asbestos related diseases, as so often happens when they are exposed. Um, from a communications point of view, from my point of view, what are we looking to do in this campaign? Well, it's to 
great awareness to educate the audience, but also to test some of the things that have changed in the last you know, eight years, technology, um, social media, et cetera, with certain channels. You know, there's quite a big difference from the last campaign. So to see what, what is actually still going to work out there, and then we can take that forward for the next few years. Um, audience, a whole range of trades people, um, as you can see from the data on the screen, you know, it's a huge amount of workers and the range of different jobs that they can do, you know, is fairly extensive. Um, and it changes obviously the nature of what they have to um, asbestos. And what we've seen in previous campaigns and from our insight is very much that there's a, a varying degree of knowledge of asbestos. You know, people have heard of it, people know it's bad for you, but what that really means in their day-to-day -day life changes quite significantly. Um, if they predominantly work in commercial buildings, they have a different view to those who work in domestic. Um, larger outfits are more likely to do the training that they're required to do so. Um, old hands often have a better understanding because it was more prevalent back in the day. Uh, so one of the things for this campaign is actually to target people who are coming into the industry, especially young people. It's eight years since we've done a campaign. So it's quite important that we raise awareness of the risks and that's still relevant to them. And, and that was one of the things what the insight showed. People just don't think it's relevant. Younger people, you know, if, especially if they've started the career, maybe a new build, you know, they've never had to consider it in their job. Yet when all of a sudden they can move into domestic refurbishment and it becomes a major risk to them. So what we want to do is actually make it quite personal. And that is why we came up with this Best Us New. As you can see, it's uh, the word in itself automatically puts it, you know, puts a personal frame on that. Um, we also changed our colours. If you know from previous campaigns, very much used a, a strong yellow, the warning sign, the triangle, um, and we wanted to differentiate it. So we've moved to a, a strong red, um, red being the colour of danger, the colour of stop, but also being the colour of that construction used to bag asbestos if they do removal. And if I were to talk, pick up some of our designers, as you will see, there's a, there's a slight pattern in, um, in the font um, and on the background, which is actually what uh, asbestos can look like um, in the real world and when it's been laid down. And the, uh, the brush of feel is to give it that cursive um, font at the end, is to make it personal. It's trying to remind people that it's got something to do with them. And that takes them to the next step, makes them, it draws them in. So we've got uh, obviously our creative, um, how we're bringing this to life. And we've got a few different examples here. So these are predominantly being used on social media at the moment. We've got some um, advertising running right now. And then goes, as you can see, the messaging is very much don't take it home, avoid disturbing asbestos. Um, the third example is got a little picture in there. As you can see, it's a quick guide for trades. So we've updated a previous reference guide, um, boiled it down to the most important information and what people need to know out there on the day. Um, and we're pushing that, you know, it's, it lives there on our microsite. And it also um, we're directing people to download it straight from social media as well. And we've gone quite well. You know, we only launched on the 6th of March. So, you know, we're about 10 days into the campaign. Um, huge amount of traffic going to the microsite pages. And um, we've seen more than seven and a half thousand downloads of the quick guide. So people, you know, are certainly getting it in their hands. Um, the next stage will be carry on pushing that and seeing how useful people are thinking it is. So just to give you an idea on what's happening in the timings. Um, we've launched, um, we've got a huge amount of partner engagement and hopefully events like this, you know, will gain that we can share the information um, following the session and hopefully you can share the campaign and support us that way. Um, we've got media story went out last week, we've got our paid for media activity. We've got a media partnership on the tools. Um, I saw the first edits of the videos um, come through for that today. Um, and some great work in that. Yeah, we've got a 61-year-old uh, person who was diagnosed um, with mesothelioma um, and his case study, you know, it's um, highly emotive and hopefully that gets the message across as well. As we go into April, it's the Global Asbestos Awareness Week at the beginning. We're looking to have a trade partnership running out in the Builders Merchant for the month as well. And then we've got more activity just coming on there. So a podcast in April ongoing media and social media, and hopefully a webinar in May as well that people can be invited to. So if you would like to get involved, um, you know, you, we'll share this information again afterwards, so you can email us directly on our campaign's email address. Um, and yeah, if you've got any ideas, anything you want to share, please get in touch. That's it, thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was absolutely fantastic. I don't know about everyone else, but John, that breathing was actually really relaxing and very insightful because it does make you really think um, just about the power of the campaign. And Denver, thank you so much. That was really, really helpful. Um, I think we're moving now over to Jim to talk about mental health. Thanks, Henrietta. Good afternoon, everybody. I hopefully be able to see my slides shortly um, but for those of you who don't know me my name is Jim Beeston I am the project partner for Bids and Communications in Balfour Beatty's Health Safety and Environment team um, and was delighted to take over the chair of the mental health um, subgroup at the end of last year. Uh, mental health is probably one of the most high profile um, health topics that is facing construction um, at the moment um, and HCLG has really had a role, as Henrietta alluded to earlier, in bringing it to the forefront of the consciousness of um, of the industry um, through things like setting up mates in mind, through some of the uh, awareness raising activities uh, that we've done. I don't think um, I need to tell anyone on this call, certainly not based on how um, au fait you were with uh, John Slido earlier. Um, mental health in construction is in an extremely parlous state. Um, the statistics around things like suicide are well known, um, but what's also coming to the fore increasingly recently are the statistics around things like um, anxiety, stress in the workplace, um, all of those sort of different mental health topics that can sort of linger under the surface. Um, so one of the things that we've done as a mental health working group really um, is just take a step back and reevaluate where we are um, as an industry, where we are as HCLG and where we need to be looking next in order to try and change the nature of mental health in the industry. So we asked ourselves, really, we are the Health and Construction Leadership Group. And what does leadership look like when we talk about mental health? What is it? You know, what counts as sort of leadership? How do we drive the industry forward? How do we improve the state of mental health in the industry? And the three tenets that sort of came to us as a group really are that it's about collaboration, it's about being proactive rather than reactive, and it's about trying to affect that genuine change, changing the dial, making that effectively stopping this from being an industry which actively harms the mental health of the people that go to work in it every day. So off the back of that, we looked at ways of maximising our impact as a working group. We are a small um, but determined uh, group of individuals, I think it's fair to say. Um, and one of the things that when we talk about that genuine change piece, when we talk about being proactive, getting out ahead of this and making it so that this isn't an industry where people's mental health is harmed and we sort of patch them up afterwards and send them back out into the workplace, but when instead we make an industry which stops that harm at source, like we would do with um, asbestosis or silicosis or any of those other elements where we look at the hierarchy of controls and we eliminate wherever possible. How do we do that with mental health in the industry? Well, taking into account the fact that we are you know, a very small working group and I will be putting out a call for volunteers later if any of you want to get involved. But really what we looked at were two major work streams for maximising the impact of our working group on mental health. So some of you may be familiar with Make It Visible, which was um, announced to great fanfare in January. It's a collaborative um, attempt to bring various parts of the industry together, and it's being chaired by uh, Sarah Meek from Mates in Mind, um, with whom obviously we have close association as HCLG and also with Bill Hill, who is the CEO of the Lighthouse Club. Um, so as HCLG, we looked at Make It Visible and is there a way that we can build on our relationship with Mates in Mind and support this collaborative effort? So support this um, activity which bring, where we bring contractors and bodies together in HCLG. How do we further that approach? Um, and we also looked at how do we lobby for real change? How do we make the sorts of impact that's going to solve this problem. And so we make it visible, um, which is divided into four work streams. Um, Sarah Meek currently is taking on the chair of the proactive support um, arm of make it visible. Um, there are also working groups on reactive support, on um, 
measurement and monitoring and on culture change. And we felt as a HCLG group, as a leadership group on mental health, that was where we wanted to be. We wanted to be getting on board with the proactive things. How do we sort of solve the problem at source? How do we prevent people from being harmed by the work that they do? Um, and that also helps us, you know, we, we can build on the uh, continued collaboration with Mates in Mind and the relationships that we have there. But also we know the scale of this problem and mental health in construction is a problem of a scale that it can sometimes sort of feel overwhelming in and of itself. It's a, a construction is such a large beast. How do we sort of make that change? And so we looked at um, using HCLG and make it visible as a force multiplier, where actually we can be a member of this wider working group um, for make it visible, but we can have our HCLG body effectively all of the people that come together in that working group can sort of be represented on the set on this working group and that will give us hopefully the ability to take away actions from make it visible that we can work on as an hclg working group and really bring the sort of breadth of perspectives that we've got in hclg etc to bear on the problem and hopefully um, use that as a method of sort of multiplying um, our impact and what we are able to do And the other thing that we looked at was lobbying for real change. And I keep talking about real change. And um, you may well say, well, well, what is that? And recently there was an all party parliamentary group report into mental health in the construction industry. And it came out with two suggestions to try and shift the dial, which I thought were really interesting. One of them was making suicide events riddle reportable. And the other was writing mental health terms into procurement um, contracts. Um, and I am going to ask you in a minute to um, simply type yes or no into the chat box. But do you think riddle reporting of suicides is feasible for our industry? I don't necessarily want you know an explanation of of why, but just just a simple yes or no. Um, and I'll be interested to see what people come up with because this is the sort of thing that's being suggested um, in terms of trying to shift that dial. Um, and I think mental health written into procurement terms, I think, just while people's answers filter in, is um, a really, really interesting place for us to be looking because it speaks to an industry where at the moment sort of there are pockets of genuine excellence in mental health in the industry. And there are pockets where we need to try and sort of um, help bring people along um, along on the journey. And getting it into procurement terms, making it so that when clients are looking to um, contract, they have to consider what a contractor is going to provide in terms of mental health will help potentially to sort of eradicate those sort of pockets where, you know, it's not as advanced as it is in other areas, because what gets written into contracts gets measured, what gets measured gets priced and what gets priced gets done. So I'm just looking into um, into the um, chat box and I think just sort of um, a very quick um, look is that the no's probably have it in the, in the chat um, and I think that's probably um, that's probably roughly accurate but this is what I sort of want to finish on is that whether or not you think that particular um, that particular solution is the right one it is, I think, indicative of where we need to be going as an industry to lobby for that real change. We need to be asking ourselves the hard questions. So this is an industry that harms the mental health of its workforce. How do we change that? Do we? You know, is it client engagement? Is it better reporting, whether that's RIDOR or something else? Is it proactive approaches? Is it legislation? You know, what is it that we need to do in order to try and um, try and drive um, better mental health in the industry and to eradicate that harm at source. So we are working with Mates in Mind on posing those hard questions, hopefully finding answers to those hard questions, and probably even the most crucial is asking those questions to the right people. Um, so the All Party Parliamentary Group, which met um, at the back end of last year, is hopefully the first step in making sure that we are trying to get to the bottom of um, what it is that we need to do to improve mental health, because this is, you know, we, we 
um, we know what the stress factors are. We can talk about time pressures. We can talk about pay. We can talk about uh, getting it into our supply chain. We can talk about all of these things that we know are causing the challenges. But what is it that we need to do to affect material change, to change the way that the industry operates so that it no longer harms the mental health of the people that work in it? So those are our two priorities um, for 2023 is going to be working as part of that make it visible thing to improve proactive mental health support in the industry and also continuing to push through lobbying efforts, through collaboration with Mates in Mind and others to try and get to the bottom of affecting material change in the industry, changing the terms under which we do business to make sure that we're an industry that no longer harms the mental health of the people that go to work in it. So. If anybody is interested in joining the Mental Health Working Group, then by all means reach out to me directly or through um, uh, through Henrietta or through um, Simon. Uh, but Henrietta, over to you. Brilliant. Thank you, Jim. That was very thought provoking. And I just think really challenging ourselves is just such a critical thing to do in, in this space and, and definitely something we should do more. And actually how we use the, you know, use HCLG um, form a position. And if there's something we want to take to clients, for example, some of the other groups that we're connected to and involved with and, and have something that we really want to champion and get behind, then that's definitely something that we should continue to do. Um, I think now it's over to you, George. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Henrietta. I just wanted to echo again just what was said about James's um, talk there, really. You know, hugely important topic for the industry. And of course, massive overlap actually with musculoskeletal disorders. You know, the chronic impacts of MSDs do lead to mental ill health. It's um, often forgotten. Um, so, just as an introduction, um, my name's George Mosey. I'm the head of health and safety for Langerock Europe. I I'm the chair of the MSD working group for the HCLG been a bit of an honour of mine for the past 18 months or so off the back of COVID. I was just going to start with a bit of background from my side though, um, not altogether known by too many people, but I, I grew up on a pig and sheep farm in North Yorkshire. Um, think more babe than sort of the darling buds of May, It's um, if that paints a picture for you. Um, in fact, my father probably is, is one of the few people in the country that looks exactly like Farmer Hoggett. Um, he's about six foot five. He, he, he has a very uncanny sort of resemblance. Um, but he's worked in farming for 70 years or so. Um, industry that has a lot of parallels with construction, a lot of farmers do a lot of building work, obviously, over their lifetime. But the point I'm making poorly is uh, it's a very manual occupation. He's He's been working, in, in, like I said, in, 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 in farming for about 70 years, his entire lifetime. He's had major issues over his time with um, bad backs, bad knees, bad shoulders. He's had three hip surgeries. He's had three of his vertebrae fused, um, you know, really as a consequence of the work that he, he decided to do, um, obviously, as a farmer. And then the chronic impacts of, of those injuries, and they are injuries ultimately, have had a hugely damaging effect on his quality of life and, and ultimately his mental health as well. So, so as such, I've got a huge passion around modernising industries, in particular farming, and that has come a long way in the past 50 years. But in particular, obviously, construction, the industry that I find myself working in, uh, and sort of dodged farming, it's fair to say, although it might be it might be there for me eventually. Um, so the fundamental point I'm trying to make here is making things less manual is is the opportunity that's, in, opportunity that's in front of us. And I think it's truly the only way in which we're going to eradicate occupational ill health within the industry. Um, and obviously my focus today around MSDs. So if it's OK, I was just going to share um, some slides. I'm probably slightly off. Um, slightly off topic. I, I know I'm the MSD chair, but there's this huge parallels here to this idea of modern methods of construction. And I just wanted to talk through through those today. Um, hopefully everyone can see my slides. I can't see anyone apart from Henrietta. Uh, I think uh, I'm assuming everyone can see them anyway. Um, so tackling op occupational ill health through modern methods of construction, you know, is is the focus of what I was going to talk about, really. Um, just to bring us back really again, traditional construction, you know, I don't really need to go into the detail of this, but, you know, this impacts the human body in a number of fairly fundamental ways. Um, you know, I've listed a few here. It's not just MSDs clearly that come as a consequence of working in um, a particularly manual type um, vocation, you know, impacts on people's lungs, obviously, as we've heard, their mental health their hearing, uh, their backs, their knees, their hips, 
um, hand-on vibration syndrome, traditional work comes with fairly traditional consequences. And that will continue. And it's just really important to state, we will continue to have these issues. It doesn't matter what we do to manage them, but we will continue to fundamentally have them unless we rethink what it is that we're attempting to do. Now, stats around occupational health are, are well publicised, probably not as well as they should be because they haven't enacted the change that we need. But 74,000 construction workers continue to suffer from work related ill health, 54% um, related to MSDs. MSDs has a huge prevalence within the industry. Um, still today, we've not managed to solve that altogether. But I would just add that other industries have, which is the opportunity that sits in front of us. And, and of course, as I mentioned, depression, anxiety, mental Ill health comes from the chronic impacts of these bad backs, bad knees, bad shoulders that do erode people's quality of life. Of course, on top of that, we have the safety issues associated with traditional work, which is you know important not to forget. But there's a quote here in yellow, which um, I don't need to say who said it, but it but it is the absolute reality of our future. Uh, unless we decide to do something different, uh, we will continue to get the same results. Hence the need to rethink construction. I, I've just shown a, a photo in the bottom right hand corner of what another industry has done um, to make work more ergonomic, more comfortable, um, less of a toll on the human body. And, and I think if I'm honest, that's where our focus and our learning needs to come from. So, so modern methods of construction isn't a confusing or cryptic um, piece in itself, but a lot of people don't understand what it actually is. So I thought I'd just provide a bit of a definition. So NMC, it's the shorthand, is a wide term embracing a range of offsite manufacturing techniques that provide alternatives to traditional building methodologies. And of course, NMC can range from whole assets being constructed from a factory built volumetric module through to use of innovative techniques for laying concrete and installing finishes. The reason why that's important, and that's, that's not my definition, you can see the quote at the bottom, is this applies to all within the industry. This isn't just something that should be conceived or, or made possible by the tier one community. There is opportunity to employ modern methods of construction, more intelligent ways of working across the entire value cycle, across the entire industry. And it's just, it's often used as an excuse that MMC is only there and available to people who can afford to build factories and then use a component led uh, build sequence. It's not the case. There is opportunity in the design and the construction engineering. I just wanted to um, remove that sort of excuse because it's it's not a fair one. Um, some companies and, and Langer Rock, the one I represent, um, have sort of started to use the shorthand of design for manufacturing assembly, DFMA. It's an offsite solution, but it's hard to uh, these three numbers really 70, 60, 30. 70 um, being the understanding that we have 70% of our components manufactured off site. This enhances quality, efficiency, and all kinds of things. But the principle being that we manufacture things in a clean, ergonomic, um, safe, sound, consistent work environment, rather than inviting hundreds of people to a construction site that we've developed and set up within a month and then expect people to work from. So this is about consistency from a manufacturing base. We see a 60% improvement in productivity uh, and ultimately a reduction of labor on site. So if we get this right and we have a component led delivery model, we require less human beings out on those dynamic, variable, unsafe, unhealthy construction sites. Instead, they will find themselves located in factories, hopefully five minutes from their home so they can have dinner with their children each new evening. But, but a, a fundamental rethinking of how we deliver construction projects. And of course, the 30 turning up, which means we have a 30% improvement on programme. We do things quicker, which means we're on site for less, again, helping to reduce that human error rate. Um, I know a, a large number of people are very familiar with this type of product set now. Um, they sit across the structural elements of what we do, the MEP elements, and obviously architectural and facades. It is possible to largely build a residential tower, as a good example now, out of these components in their entirety. Um, you just have to have the imagination to go after them and obviously the tenacity as well, because these do require a manufacturing mindset. Um, now, not to state the obvious, but uh, some pictures here of what these products look like if they are manufactured in these consistent environments and then delivered to site. I think what you'll just notice from these photos is they are clean. Hope, hopefully they, they, they seem clean, clean, consistent, professional. We're talking about trades to technicians, professionalizing the industry and being component led, more akin to how a manufacturing facility for the automobile industry works today 
I think you can be sure that they're not forging um, elements of the car chassis in the Mercedes factory. They're done in other factories and delivered pre-packed and delivered and then assembled. And we've got to use that type of thinking if we're going to move the industry forward. Um, just as a very obvious example, this is a shaft construction on a project in London, a Langerort project. Um, a great example in my mind. We were unable to um, in, in totally for this it's it's the base of a of a um, stair core in effect, but we were unable to um, product laid the manufacture of all of the components on the right hand side. So what you can see here on the left is a twin wall solution. Um, we pour a in situ stitch on the inside of these twin wall panels. Um, they were installed or all of the components on the left that doesn't require all the false work, false work and form work and scaffold was installed in a single day by three people. There was a day then to pour the concrete. Um, so in total, this this was all installed for, by three people in two days. On the right hand side, um, it took us 12 days to erect all of the form work and obviously stand the, the reinforcement, a day to pour and then two days to strike. So that took us 15 days in total and, and required 15 people, in fact. So an activity that took two days with two with three people versus 15 days with 15 people. And I don't need to point out the obvious disadvantages of trying to build something like you can see on the right versus something you can see on the on the left. Now, it is important to mention that precast panels do come with a elevated risk profile from a safety perspective around lifting. Absolutely. But these are things we can better control. Uh, I've built what you can see on the right as well, a number of people on the call will, will have as well, and it is extremely complicated and it has all kinds of health and safety consequences. I just thought this was quite an articulate example for a compelling case. So fundamentally what we're talking about is taking project risk um, and trying to turn it into manufacturing risk, which is smaller and, and often delivered in more static, controlled and consistent facilities. And this is what will lead to long term health improvements for the people that work on our sites. I said before, just it's really important to consider this does require a manufacturing mindset. If you um, order a car from Audi tomorrow, you will wait 16 weeks for your car to turn up because um, that's the requirement. And ultimately you accept it because you're asking for a high performance product that's going to turn up and it's going to turn up to the exact requirements that you stipulated. The trim, uh, the lights, the, the sunroof that was optional or not. We need to get more comfortable with clients, with consultants, with the industry and our supply chain in particular, at better providing this design information earlier so then we can move to a more modern methods approach. Reactive construction is traditional construction. We can change things the day before we deliver them. That kind of mindset needs to be thrown out the window. We need to be that needs to become socially unacceptable. Everything needs to be pre-planned 16 weeks prior, and then we move into a logical, consistent space where we can deliver things without change. That leads to healthier and safer outcomes for the people that work on construction sites. Design change is a leading cause of occupational ill health and safety related issues. Um, it's been poorly documented over the years, but it does have a hugely impact, a huge impact. Um, just linked to that, if you have a component led uh, delivery model, you can then properly consider this concept of whole life cycle safety. Every component that comes to your site is better considered for its transportation, its lifting and assembly. But then beyond that, you can assess specifically the occupational health consequences of every component um, and how they might affect not only people manufacturing them, transporting them, lifting them and installing them. So and, and then finally commissioning and then decommissioning if you were to take it to its nth degree. But it just allows a much better assessment. And of course, if we do things, the more traditional types of things we do in, in today on site, if we do them in a manufacturing context, we're able to better control them. We have better um, equipment, better facilities, on tool extraction, you know, whatever it might be, it leads to advantages across the board. And we're certainly seeing that from a Langwell perspective in our manufacturing facilities. It's much more comfortable to work in a factory than on a live construction site, especially through the, the sort of four or five months of winter, as you can appreciate. Um, this really just broadly makes that same point that I mentioned before. Um, and then if you just consider the, the concept of um, the fact that within construction, we largely employ a male male dominated workforce. This is because of the nature of the work we do currently. You'd likely have to or you're expected to have a certain degree of strength to work on a construction site to shift reinforcement, pour concrete, stand shutters. 
in a manufacturing facility, we can do this with mechanical assistance. It's a, a lot less manual it, by nature, and we can use ergonomic working stations, gantry cranes, and actually the experience of someone working in a manufacturing facility today is actually very comfortable. Um, and you don't have to wear the full five points of PPE. And ultimately, you can work well into your 60s and in fact, into your 70s if you choose. And of course, it's much more inclusive. Um, we've got a number of women that work in the factory now who are in, involved in all kinds of um, the manufacturing of all kinds of componentry. So the dream, I guess, really for the industry could be this model moving towards this a reduced working week um, in terms of hours, reduced number of weeks per year and also that gender balance piece turning up. And this is this idea of trades to technicians, people rethinking the industry, rethinking the actual work that we ask our people to do to lead to better health and safety outcomes. I just wanted to finish very quickly on this idea of um, kinematic simulation. It's a piece of work that we're starting to play with as a business. It, it's not fully baked yet, but it's this idea of using AI and also software to do ergonomic audits on certain types of work. Now, as I mentioned, it's very variable working on a construction site, but in a manufacturing facility with consistent types of work, we can really assess the impacts of musculoskeletal disorders um, that affect our people. And the software is quite intelligent, but it allows a kinetic assessment of the impacts of working in acute positions like this chap is today with the arms elevated above his head. This has a long term impact on people's um, occupational health, especially around musculoskeletal disorders. So this type of software is available to us and it allows a proper assessment. So then we can look to improve the experience of this individual doing this specific task. It's just a quick example. So I just wanted to finish with an open ended question not to answer, but how can we collectively accelerate our experience of modern methods of construction to realise the significant health and safety benefits? That's, I guess, a challenge, uh, one that we all need to take on eventually, but we do need to eventually um, be able to compete with the automobile industry. And I think they're providing um, quite a useful reference point for us at the moment. Thanks, Henrietta. Um, hopefully that came across OK and the slides all showed fine. No, that was absolutely fantastic, George. And it just goes to show that um, the interplay between all of the different risks and actually if, you, if we challenge ourselves to think differently, how we can have a multiple kind of beneficial impact. I think your um, your focus on inclusion as well kind of was was very thought provoking. I remember being on site at kind of the age of 22 and trying to lift up some of the blocks that the guys were moving around and I couldn't get it off the ground. And it really made me think about um, manual handling risk, but also that inclusion point, I think is a really, really good one. So beneficial in so many ways. Um, would love to reach out if anybody does have any questions um, for Sam and I or for any of the panelists, if you want to ask them now, um, do raise your hand or pop it in the chat. Um, if not, I'll just do a little pause to see whether anyone wants to raise their hand. Um, please do feel free to reach out to us um, through the website directly to Sam and I. Um, all the other panellists. Thank you so much for um, coming and spending an hour with us to focus on occupational health. And thank you so much to everyone for supporting the session. Um, Simon, have you got any other thoughts you wanted to raise with everyone? Uh, no, I do, um, you know, if it's not today, but something occurs to anybody and they want to um, fire it into us, then, you know, we're, we're always glad to uh, receive comments and ideas on how we can improve and uh, really make a difference. Um, but I'd just like to thank uh, all of our speakers today as well for some um, some really thought provoking and insightful uh, presentations as well. Um, particularly George, I think at the end, uh, I think you really nailed that. It's uh, it's a really interesting area and uh, and I think one that's um, that's got so much potential um, for, for really making big, big changes as as uh, as we go into the future. So um, yeah, I think we might have a few questions coming in now. So um, Keith, uh, Keith Prince has asked, do we have enough designers engaged in the conversation? Which I suppose goes to, to your presentation, George, in particular, um, because it all starts with with design, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, obviously me and Keith work quite closely together, so he's uh, he's really set me up there. Um, you know, the, the, answer, <laughs> the, the answer is absolutely um, not enough um, currently. Um, you know, I won't go into the sort of politics of it, but, uh, you know, there is so much more designers and the design fraternity can do in this space. Um, they, I think we sometimes, and it's not just designers, but clients, consultants and contractors, we, we accept the least worst design. Um, and we lack the imagination um, to do more. 
and and actually at the moment i would just add it is still i think I, i've sort of been quoted of saying this so I'm, I'm sort of kick myself saying it again but it's still socially acceptable to design certain things that we know will cause ill health and harm um and there's certain traditional trades you know that that we we should have made redundant and removed from our operations a long time ago a long time ago um, and we haven't quite managed to do that yet. So there is lots of work to do. Uh, what I would say is if if you are involved in a in a live project, and, and especially if it's during involved in a PCSA, an early pre-construction phase, then please, please try and capture the imagination of the design team and, and drag them into these early conversations. And, and in fact, make them walk in the shoes of a bricklayer um, for a couple of days. They will soon see the reality of this type of work. And um, and, and potentially look to redesign what they were looking to do in a certain way that makes it more more or less manual for those individuals. And um, there's all kinds of solutions which we could go into, but not for now, maybe. OK, and then uh, we have another question, don't we, from uh, Julie Gelder. We tend to focus on larger projects and large contractors and larger clients uh, in relation to MMC. But what about opportunities for smaller builders? Yeah, maybe if I can just go again. So, um, you know, I did I did put that challenge out there at the start. Um, modern methods of construction, in my mind, isn't just about the base design. It's not just about the component set. It can be the way in which we deliver work. And, um, you know, you often see um, small and medium sized builders um, installing hoists on five board scaffolds. And I'm, I'm always amazed because they're quite unique bits of kit, but you know, they just save the laborers having to, you know, carry you know, a thousand pantiles up a three story scaffold. And, and it's really it's really great to see when they do that and they make that investment. Um, so modern methods of construction can just mean um, employing mechanical means. And you can get all of these things, these bits of kit from, you know, local wholesale traders, HSS, there are others, not, not the BBC, um, but there are others. And, you know, this can start at a very basic level, um, but, but what we're in the business of trying to do is, is protecting the most vulnerable within our industry. And it's still, again, socially acceptable to ask a 22 year old labourer on the minimum wage to unsafely and unhealthily carry 10,000 pantiles up a three story ladder for months, whereas we could have actually installed a hoist or used a telehandler. So modern methods of construction doesn't have to be in the base design. It can be in the tools and equipment we put to work as part of the construction phase. And I, th I think one um, one thing that occurs to me, uh, really, George, is that actually through uh, greater mechanisation and more off-site uh, component and and um, manufacturing for uh, uh, or designing for assembly on site, you actually hit all three of our uh, focus areas that we're currently looking at. So you have a lot less cutting and making things fit and trimming up. Um, so a lot less. Um, silica and dust exposure um, uh, you clearly have a lot less manual tasks um, because you've got the mechanization in there and you also have some mental health benefits as well because if you've got people um, working in a in a fixed environment um, producing many of those components then they're not having to travel long long distances to site and stay away and uh, you get the benefits from uh, better work-life balance and and as you said being able to go back to have dinner with your kids so um you know it's there's a lot to be said for it isn't there okay um i think we've just got apologies coming in now for people having to move on to other meetings so <laughs> uh, i don't think there's any more questions at the moment um but um but you know as henrietta and i have both said and our speakers you know please do reach out to us uh, you, there's plenty of uh, opportunities to make contact either through the website or by getting in contact with any of us directly um and um you know we really do need your ideas and enthusiasm as, as well to you know help us keep these topics moving on so i think uh I'd like to thank everybody for their attendance today, particularly our speakers, uh, and uh, um, for, for making each of those sessions uh, really, you know, quite thought provoking. Um, and um, really, I, I don't know whether there's anything else you want to just round off with, Henrietta. No, that's close. perfect, Simon. Yeah. Just um, thank you very much. And we have recorded it. So obviously, um, if you do want to share it more broadly, then please do feel free. Um, and thank you, everyone.
See you soon. Thanks all. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Many thanks. Thank Bye. you.